Hello, hello to everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, LIBER webinar, uh, which focuses on the recent developments in the copyright field. Uh, I will be your uh, host uh, for uh, today. And uh, my name is Yanis Tsakonas. I'm acting director in the Library and Information Center of the University of Patras in Greece, as well as chair of the Innovative Scholarly Communication Steering Committee of uh, LIBER. Um, today we have uh, three speakers who have deep knowledge of uh, these matters and have, have helped LIBER a lot to grow in, uh, this, uh, in this field. Uh, let me tell you that this webinar is being recorded and soon after uh, the end of the webinar you will be informed about its availability online on the YouTube uh, channel of uh, LIBER. We already have uploaded the slides on Zenodo and you can find the link in the attendees uh, uh, chat. Uh, and this uh, chat box um, will be useful to everybody so that you can post your questions there. And uh, at the end of the presentations, I will address uh, these uh, to our speakers. Uh, as you know, Liber is uh, the largest network of European research libraries. We have over uh, 440 uh, members and our mission is to enable outstanding research. We believe that in order to do this, everything that we do should be um, open and inclusive. And uh, as you may know, our strategy is quite ambitious and have these five aims until uh, the year 2022. I will not waste much time. You can easily go to the uh, libereurope.eu and find uh, 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 the strategy document of LIBER as well as the Open Science Roadmap. And uh, LIBER was, has been very active over the course of the last years in the copyright uh, field. Thanks to our working group members and other colleagues all around Europe, and of course, the Liber officers uh, has worked uh, uh, close with uh, members of the European Mar Parliament and the European Union officers to promote the interests of uh, our libraries and our research institutions. Uh, we joined uh, forces with other library organizations like Blida and IFLA, uh, university associations like uh, EUA, or research organizations like uh, Science Europe, as well as with organizations and associations from uh, small, medium enterprises and startups. Uh, quite often we have this question if we have a voice, and I think that uh, uh, the work that uh, Liber has done uh, uh, over the years, it has not passed unnoticed. We have uh, many references from uh, uh, various parties, including uh, the report on the future of scholarly publishing and scholarly communication, or a recent article in Time Higher, uh, Times Higher Education. And of course, uh, a couple of years back, Liber has been uh, recognized as one of the key players uh, in this field in Politico's copyright power matrix. I will uh, give the speech first to Ben White, who comes from uh, um, British Library, uh, and then the rest of our speakers uh, will follow. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send them to the chat box. Ben. Hello, Ben. We have a slight uh, problem and... Uh... Oh, sorry. Ah, here it is. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, great. Yeah, yes. okay, sorry about that. Um, 
So um, what I was saying, but you couldn't hear, was that really the presentation that we're doing now is focused on implementation uh, across the European Union. As Yanis said, we worked very um, well with a number of different other library organizations, as well as Science Europe and the European Universities Association. And we made material changes, which the, my presentation in part goes to show. So we, we improved the, um, the, the, the draft copyright directive, which was introduced in 2016, I think quite significantly in, in certain areas, which uh, I'll talk through. So now we're interested in, in implementation at member state level, and um, that has to be done by the 7th of June 2021. And this is, a, this is a sort of a golden opportunity if libraries and universities and researchers engage to ensure that the directive is implemented well in a way that actually makes research and the activities of libraries possible, or at the other end, um, if it's implemented not with our interests uh, front and foremost, probably um, you know, more to the interests of the publishing industry or, or, or the creative industries. So a directive sets a general um, direction of travel. It doesn't and it, and it gives some details and some obligations. There is a lot of leeway, so we can have a good implementation in one country and a bad implementation in one country. So um, I'd much like you to uh, get involved. And Libra is there. Um, again, if you look on the website, the blog that I just posted, um, we would like to hear from people how we can support you in responding to consultations. Or if you don't understand what, what, what a certain article is trying to do, we're here to help. So, um, we, we, if, so we would very much like you to contact Lieber, so Lieber at kb.nl, which hopefully Friedel can um, put up. So we would we would very much like you to let us know uh, how we can help you in your country implement the, um, the legislation in, in a way that helps libraries and researchers. So that's just a quick slide showing the organizations that we've worked with very successfully. Um, oops, gone black. Um, so yeah, that's kind of right at the bottom as it says please let us know and i've posted in the left hand um box there the email so we would like to hear from you if you are thinking about um engaging in in the transposition the amendment of this directive at, at, at member state level i'm just So we're going to run through in numerical order. So when um, the Commission first introduced the draft directive in 2016, it, it actually excluded like um, a university. Um, libraries were originally excluded. Sorry, my 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 uh, it, it hung up there. So I don't know if you heard that. So. Um, the original proposal was for research organizations and universities. So, for example, um, national libraries, if not part of the university, would have been excluded when it was first introduced. It, talk, it allowed public-private partnerships when uh, no deciding controlling power um, sat overseeing and directing the purpose of, of the data mining. Importantly, it did not allow contracts and still does not allow contracts to override the exception. So essentially, this exception has become a right because it, a contract cannot remove your, your right to do text and data mining. And publishers can only apply technical measures aimed at protecting the security of the platform. So I won't go into the details, but, but the... Um, the laws around 
DRMs or technical protection measures have been amended. Um, so if you're having te problems, text and data mining, because of technical protection measures on the servers of the publishers, then you have the right to appeal that. So, so um, that's one of the, I think, the benefits that the ability of rights holders to um, to frustrate your access to technical material through the exercise of DRMs and technical protection measures has, has been weakened. Um, and and it explicitly states and exception is not subject to remuneration. So the exception should be free. No money is payable. Um, so after working with particularly the committees in the European Parliament, LIBRA and the other library groups were able to ensure that all forms of libraries and museums and cultural heritage institutions could benefit from this exception. And, um, and, and again, there was discussion about how long you should be able to um, keep your derived data, the data that you've been data mined, and those kind of obligations have now gone. So what, what we also worked on, because um, in the modern world, universities work a lot with private industry, um, was a new exception which was introduced by, by member states, and this allows commercial or, or individuals to data mine. So the, the previous exception was limited to libraries and research organizations and universities. Anybody can benefit from Article 4. Um, it allows you to keep the results for as long as is necessary, which is good, given that you're investing a lot of time, money, and effort in creating derived data sets for your algorithms to analyze. It is subject to technical and contract override in the way that the non-commercial exception is not. Um, however, for publicly available web websites, if you're mining the open web, um, only technical measures can be used, not, not contractual restrictions. So it doesn't matter on the open web what the terms and conditions say there will have to be some kind of technical protocol that is developed, which says, no, we don't want you to mine this website. And again, it's not subject to remuneration. So we're kind of gonna do a bit of a double act on, on this. So I will now pass over to my colleague, Armin. Yes, hello, this is Armin from uh, Berlin State Library. Uh, we will go on now with uh online teaching exception in Article 5 of the uh, directive, uh, which um, detailed name is use of works and other subject matter in digital and cross-border teaching activities. Well, we, we've already had some kind of exception for teaching, for example, in, in Germany before, but now on EU level, it's all slightly change, changed. And of course, it is... Uh, cross-border now and mainly mandatory too, like the uh, exception for text and data mining. So um, what does online teaching or digital teaching activity means in this in the sense of Article 5? Well, um, who are the establishments allowed to, to use this digital teaching? It's an educational establishments which have been recognized by member states, um, like it's written there, including those involved in primary, secondary, vocational, and higher education. Uh, so the um, organizers of this uh, digital teaching activity uh, in, in the organizers not included library, for example. The library is not per se an educational establishment. But if one of those um, 
named educational establishment uh, organizes uh, digital teaching activity, it can also take place in a museum or in a library. So that is not excluded. Um, what also is um, allowed uh, in this exception is the use, not only online, but also the use of copyrighted materials in the classroom without license, certainly. Um, for example, on electronic, electronic whiteboards. And um, as long as all the particular teaching activity is non-commercial, which means um, that also, let's say, private school, schools and private universities can act as one of those privileged establishments here, as long as a particular teaching activity is non-commercial. Um, this exception also includes the students um, or pupils can access a learn this learning platform, this online learning, for example, Moodle platform from home. Um, and um, well, this is about copyrighted materials, which um, on that platform. So that's what it's all about. So you don't necessarily need license for, for this. And that's what it's um, all about. So studying from home is included. Um, so that's how it looks. Um, well, digital teaching, uh, I think I don't have to comment that anymore. But if we look at it in detail, uh, we can see that this group of, of students and staff or pupils um, is closed. So we need a kind of authentication procedure. So it's not allowed to do this openly on the internet. There is a certain, well, certain group which can have access and the people have to identify themselves. So certainly because, well, it's a, EU um, directive, we have this uh, also cross border, so we can, so the students or pupils uh, can look, look at it from different countries within the European Union. Um, so far, the directive is mandatory, which means um, every EU country has to implement this part of the directive. But um, well, there, there might be slightly differences in the end between the EU member states because they are allowed first to specify the proportion of a work or other subject matter <clears throat> that can be used. So we again always spoke, uh, speaking uh, about copyrighted materials because, well, if something is uh, public domain, you, you don't have to ask anywhere. You can use it uh, anyway. So, uh, for example, well, in Germany we had 15% now, or we have 15% now in our uh, legislation, um, but it can be 25 or even 50%. Well, uh, there might be different in the different member states. <clears throat> so, library organizations uh, can uh, press for a bigger proportion, with my, which might uh, to be allowed in in those electronic uh, learning. Uh, environments. Uh, member states can also provide for, for <coughs> fair compensation for the rights holders. It can mean well, for the authors or also the publishers, which is also allowed now by this uh, copyright directive. Um, this fair compensation is normally uh, distributed by collective societies. And the member states can exclude specific uses or types of materials. For example, uh, textbooks um, intended for the educational market or even also sheet music. Um, I know this discussion also from, um, from Germany, for example. So that means that this uh, licensing offer can somehow overrun this uh, mandatory uh, legislation. Um, so if uh, publishers, for example, offer their textbooks on a licensing platform where the textbooks for this purpose of the learning environments are e easily available. Um, 
and uh, those licenses are easily visible for those educational establishments who wants to use them. Um, these uh, licenses overrun the, the legislation, so you have to license and cannot use the, the exception. So I skip to Ben again now. Hi, so the the next um, exception is for digital preservation. So it makes uh, this exception mandatory across the EU and it, it explicitly allows preservation in digital forms. Again, there shouldn't be technical protection measures or contract measures which, which stop this. Um, but when it was first introduced in 2016, it was silent on preservation networks. And by that, we mean different organizations shared digital infrastructure. Because in the digital world, it's increasingly common that organizations work together um, to, to on, 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 on digital preservation given the cost and the technical expertise that's required. So again, um, by working with the committees in the uh, European Parliament, we were able to get into the recitals at the start of the directive, an explicit reference to digital preservation networks, including networks that work across borders. So um, again, I think, I think that's quite uh, interesting in that um, it allows um, explicitly now allows organizations to work on in copyright works when when preserving them together and cross-border so the next exception is um, really what I call mass digitization exception so this is Europe's response really to the Google book um, program and all the litigation that took place in in the US over many many different years. So what what this relates to when it was first introduced was um, out of commerce works and that the solution for mass digitization was um, the use of getting licenses from collecting societies to do the mass digitization of out of commerce works um and i suppose at the high level it it also um it, it, out of commerce works essentially it, it didn't explicitly explain this but referred to material that had been in commerce at one point and was no longer. Um, so that was one of the issues that we, we had. First of all, the issue was that it was license-based. Well, what happens if there are no collecting societies or what happens if the collecting society exists, but they cannot offer a license um, because the law does not allow them to offer a license to universities and cultural heritage organizations for putting material on the open web so we saw no kind of answer to those questions it excluded all um, non-eu and eea authors and as you can imagine in a journal article or a newspaper article or in a film you don't really know if you know jean patrice is is he French, is he Belgian, is he Canadian, is he Senegalese? Um, it, it, it really, at a practical level, there were problems with the way that non-EU and EEA creators were excluded. Um, it requires, required that um, you advertise uh, the works that you wish to make available online that you believe to be out of commerce. That needs to be... Um, that needs to be made available for a period of six months before publication on the EU Intellectual Property Office website. And um, as a sort of an extended form of collecting collective licensing, it allows collecting societies to represent not just their members, 
but non-members also for this specific purpose. And again, the one of the reasons for advertising what you wish to 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 digitise and make available online is that it. Allows don't want um, even if it's commercially unavailable if they don't want that material to be made commercially available then um, the rights holder can claim it. when it was first introduced there were very the definition of out of commerce works was very precise for example it 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 even if if a work was available in translation form, but not in your language, you were still not able to digitize and make available online uh, that work in your own language, even though that was not commercially available, as I've just said. And um, it, it also introduced the, the concept of stakeholder dialogue in order to discuss how best to implement the legislation. So I think this is one of the areas where we had an awful lot of work, uh, work cut out for ourselves. And by working with a number of key MEPs in the European Parliament, we were able to make this exception and provision a lot more enabling than it, than it currently or originally was. So we were able to extend the definition to cover not just out of commerce works, but unpublished works also. And then having explained that not all countries have collecting societies for books, newspapers, sound recordings, films, and that even if they might exist, that they do not have the legal mandate um, and, and to offer a license for the purposes of uh, articles 8 to 11, um, we were able to introduce this con con concept of a backstop exception. That backstop exception means is that um, you can use the exception for digitization of out of commerce and never in commerce works, um, except if there is a license available. So essentially it creates this incentive for collecting societies to offer universities, museums, libraries, etc., a license. And if they don't, then you can use the exception. Um, the law allows member states to put in cutoff dates. So for example, France has the date of 2000, Germany has the date of 1966. Those kind of cutoff dates are allowed to be introduced at member state level. Um, it allows, if you under license and under the exception, the material to be available across the EU. Um, however, if it's under license, then that will be subject to the terms of that contract. That, that point about excluding third country nationals, non-EU -E nationals, non-EEA nationals, that was improved somewhat. So now the language talks about predominantly um, if the work consists of third party nationals, then it, 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 it cannot be um, used in the case of artistic works and, and text based works um, and slightly different rules, as you can see there for sound and film. So. Essentially, if you're digitizing journals, newspapers that are bound to have non-EU citizens in, as long as they're a minority and you're acting responsibly, then then um, you, 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 you're, you're probably all right. Oh. Just the time. Um, Maybe I will skip over the slide. Um, essentially, um, this 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 is uh, slightly different, but it allows collecting societies to represent for specific purposes only um, um, the, the works of non-members. So this makes 
extended collective licensing, for example, that we see in the UK, Scandinavia, Czech Republic, legal. Um, there are questions over, over that as a result of a recent court case. And in France, I believe this is going to enable um, Relia, the, the mass digitization project where publishers have been um, digitizing back catalogs. I think this will mean that that again, that activity is legal because it has to be had to be suspended recently as a result of an ECJ case. Amen. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's uh, go on with Article 14, which is about uh, works of visual art in the public domain, um, which actually can be also library and research related if we want to publish some um, artwork, photographed uh, artwork in on the, our websites, for example. But I will do this very quickly. So what is meant with um, public domain artwork? Well, an artwork where may, mainly paintings where the term of protection of a work has already expires, uh, expired. We all know that it normally it expires 70 years after the death of the um, so um, in the article 14, it said that any material resulting from this, from an act of reproduction of that work is not subject to copyright or related right. That means that, well, if you have a public domain work, it is meant to stay in the uh, public domain uh, if you just make a, make a reproduction of it. Um, so the question still is a little bit, what is a pure reproduction? So if you make a photograph, is that a reproduction? Mainly, well, it seems to be a reproduction, uh, but um, there might be some uh, different approaches also in different uh, states. But the main thought is what is in the public domain, for example, a painting has to stay in the public domain if we just reproduce it and put it on the internet, for example. So um, let's go on with uh, yeah with the two most disputed articles. Uh, the first one of which is um, the so-called also so-called link tax, um, which means the protection of press publication concerning online uses. Uses. So what does that mean? Are press publication protected by copyright anyway? Normally, yes. They are, but now we've got another layer of protection um, thanks to the lobbying of big uh, newspaper publishers. So um, who is addressed by this uh, Article 15? Um, it's um, about information society service providers, which mainly means websites, news aggregator, aggregators, and search engines, um, which is actually wider than the former um, uh, law in Spain and Germany, um, because they only um, comprised uh, mainly search engines. So now it's all, it can be also websites of libraries, um, which might be, uh, might be uh, affected. So if they use press publications, um, even a small part, I will talk about that in a, in a, a moment, uh, they need a license for the dissemination of this even small part of press publication. So um, what is it good for? Well, like I said, copyright works like full newspaper articles normally are copyright protected anyway. Um, but what happens if uh, little snippets, like for example, Google News are used? It has always been a problem uh, with the burden of proof for the copyright protection, for example, for the publishers, because it's not clear in, in uh, individual cases sometimes if this or that snippet is uh, copyright protected or not. So um, now with this um, 
uh, new protection of press, pu press publication, they can uh, claim this right in these uh, little snippets. Um, so um, press publishers don't have any litigation risk and, and litigation costs anymore. Um, so it, it all the new rights makes it easier for pr press publishers, but it might not make it easier for the users. Of, so um, here in this uh, slide, I define a little bit more what these services mean. I already said this, these services, which are addressed by this law, um, can be also uh, private, not private, but um, can be uh, institutional websites, for example. Um, you see that on the bubble on the right hand side. So, um, and um, what is um, this press publication now? It's defined in the article or in the recitals of the uh, directive. Uh, it's every collection composed mainly of literary works of a journalistic nature um, and even individual items within a periodical already regularly updated publications are uh, uh, protected, which is not meant uh, with press publication is websites, blogs, and so on. And what is not meant is scientific journals. So um, in um, the act of implementation of this article into the national uh, laws of the EU member states, we would have to really make or uh, look for a clear um, definition which excludes really the scientific journal. So we have no, so hopefully we will not have any um, uh, legal limbo there. So no license is required for simple hyperlinking or use of individual words, but everything above that can be protected by this uh, right of press publishers for uh, press publications. Mm. So how get uh, publishers, the press publishers get the money for it? Just a uh, short overview. So the news aggregator search engine or website of your library um, have to license it normally with um, collective society that might be working in the future. In Germany, it was the V Verwertungsgesellschaft uh, Media who was involved, however, didn't really work well. Uh, it produced only uh, lawyer costs and nothing else. Um, and well, the press publishers registered by in this uh, collective society get the money from it. And so that's a very simple, uh, well, uh, graphic, I have to admit. Mm, so what does it have to do with us? Um, well, it can, well, it could have an impact on online catalogs and newspaper related projects if we have newspaper articles in it or or, or uh, if we hint to, to newspaper articles in them or have some metadata about them even. Depends if they're already the, the, um, the parts in the metadata are more than simple words or more than hyperlinks. Um, the right to quote from article for researchers, <clears throat> well, it's not affected. It's it's a right to quote from the article still. Um, but before we had this right for press publications, it was easier because the right of quotation is always a little bit uh, blurry also for other uh, quotations from other um, sources. Um, yeah. That's what it has to be with our community. So let's go on with the other very disputed article, which is um, was named or titled the upload filters. However, that word no nowhere appears in that article. It's uh, article 17, certain users of protected content by online services. So what is that? Um, the idea was or is to uh, prevent 
the online availability of unauthorized works or other subject matter on platforms, however, copyright works. Um, the platforms, um, well, like U2's, YouTube, uh, Tumble, Facebook, shall have more responsibility for the user generated content uploaded on the platforms. Um, so platform liability for will not be there anymore for them. We have this platform liability limitation um, codified in the um, e-commerce directive, which means, well, they could uh, make these works, uh, this user generated content available, but they had to take it down on the notice from uh, the rights holder. So there are new obligations for those platform providers. Uh, so why it is problematic? Um, well, they, uh, platform providers have to install systems to check all uploaded content in advance. Um, so there will be, has to be a database and storage with all the worldwide copyrighted content, uh, which has to be consulted for this kind of filtering. Um, <clears throat> so it has to filter or it has to uh, check if the material that you upload is copyright protected. Uh, for example, is the copyright term expires, expired? Does someone, ha it has to check if someone else has the copyright in it. Um, or is this uh, communication or this work better uh, covered by copyright exceptions, uh, which can be quotation, criticism, uh, review, or parody. Um, so um, another issue is the issue of power. So only a few companies can can build up one of uh, one filter, which really includes all the worldwide copyrighted content, which is still uh, kind of um, well. I kind of think uh, how you uh, will be able to build this up. Um, then issues of privacy because the filtering company will have access to all information about all worldwide uploaded content and all claimed copyright. So they, this company will have a lot of cop, uh, power and a lot of insight about uh, internet uh, communication and censorship issues uh, because this infrastructure structure would also allow governments to control all uploaded contents if they get the idea to to um, oblige those companies to give them their information. So I think this is one of my last uh, slides. It seems a bit, a little bit chaotic, but I assure you as a PowerPoint, animated PowerPoint presentation, it looks good. So um, just an example. If, for example, um, you, um, the uploading person um, can be you or me or your university, uh, uploads contents, uh, the filter has to check all the things that I was have been uh, talking about just now uh, before it gets um, uh, available to the public. And um, for example, this one, this could be an arts professor who wants to upload a conference talk, for example, uh, and his presentation, including citations of photos or artwork. So might be even a presentation like this, if I had ex included some uh, photos or some graphics. Um, um, well, then this filter would have to check all the, um, all the uh, contents that I have uploaded um, under the, the criteria that I have mentioned before it gets available to the public. So what else is to say um, about uh, these uh, upload filters? Who is not in the first place um, concerned? Uh, not for profit services like um, online encyclopedias like Wikipedia, but also um, educational and scientific repositories of research organizations and universities but um, only if they're not for profit. So there might be, it might be a little bit difficult uh, if you have public-private partnership. 
are they really non for profit or not or, or repositories of private universities um, so um excluded is also um are also services available to the public in the eu then for less than three years so you uh, if you start with a new startup you have uh, you're excluded still and have um, some um, better op opportunities to start as long as your turnover is under 10 million and as long as your number of monthly unique visitors doesn't exceed 5 million um, so um, well what the directive also says that there is no general monitoring obligation on the internet by these filters um, well it's hard to see how it could not be a general monitoring oblig obligation to install these filters um, and um, on the other hand, rights holder to in, enable those uh, online or upload filters to work have to provide their information about their, their copyright. So um, if they don't provide their copyright information, they are uh, somehow excluded of um, this strict platform responsibility. Though, So in these cases, probably we'll go back to this old rule of light, um, notice and takedown. So, yeah, we're coming back to the slide. Um, yeah, and one of the big questions is still um, how the people who want to make use of copyright exceptions, which are, well, copyright exceptions is the permitted use of copyrighted works, how they will still have the right to upload, for example, their citations. Uh, if they are filtered out by this upload filtered. So um, in the um, directive, it is uh, the member states are obliged to uh, provide a complaint and redress mechanism. Well, we don't know now how they will look like. Um, and well, for example, there has been an implementation note on that from Germany. So um, the, these filter companies would have to use an open source software for upload filters so everybody can see how it works and uh, they have to make guarantees for making use of copyright exceptions but we don't know how these these things shall uh, work so yeah thank you very much that was was it for me i think Yes, so uh, hello, um, Jonas Holm is my name, um, and I'm delighted to, to make a little guest appearance here today. Um, I used to be actually the chair of this uh, Liber work, legal working group on copyright that uh, together with Ben and others uh, participated in, in um, our lobbying activities regarding the uh, implementation of the uh, DSM directive. I'm currently working as an attorney at law, practicing at a Swedish law firm, and I'm also a legal advisor to the Swedish government uh, on copyright, but also GDPR uh, issues. And um, I'm actually here today to, to tell you a little bit about the national implementation, how member states think when they're going to change uh, their respective copyright acts. But I'm also quite curious about uh, your questions about this directive, because uh, as opposed to one, one might think, actually, the uh, member state governments, or at least uh, the Swedish government, is quite interested about the, uh, the views of the uh, cultural heritage institutions and, and libraries in the implementation of this directive. And um, any views I might express in your questions, it's, it's my personal views as a practicing attorney of law, not, not uh, the views of the Swedish government, just, just to make that clear. Uh, and I would like to point out that this is quite an extensive directive for, for being a, a European legislative piece. It's 117 pages. I think the final draft had about 32 articles. So it's quite uh, a piece of legislation that's going to be adapted in the National Copyright Act of the Member States. And that's what, that's what we are doing now, actually, at uh, the uh, government, the member state governmental level. And as Ben said at the very beginning of this seminar, there's, there's a bit of leeway. So the implementation 
uh, will be um, slightly different uh, since this is a directive after all. This is not uh, a binding regulation for the member states. So you will still have the opportunity to, to influence your, your national government on, on how the exact uh, um, changes to, to your copyright acts uh, will be f will be formulated. But um, I uh, can also make the observation that when we implement the directive in in uh, national copyright legislation, we will also take regard to uh, data protection, to the general data protection regulation, uh, the GDPR that you all are aware of being implemented uh, last year. And especially in the case of Article 3 and 4 DDM, uh, GDPR uh, um, perspective is also uh, quite uh, important because the material that you're doing DDM on uh, contains uh, personal data as well. And some of you might have noticed that there's even an article now in, in Article 28 in, in the DSM directive that uh, observes that the GDPR should be observed in all data processing carried out uh, with support of the directive. This is actually just information because all uh, acts of personal data processing in, in the European Union should, should of course observe the GDPR. But this is this is, it's an article that Parliament uh, in the last minute added uh, to, to the, uh, the directive. Um, so, how will we do it in, in Sweden? Uh, well, this will be implemented through an internal legal promemoria with uh, proposals for a change in the International uh, Copyright Act, Swedish Copyright Act. And uh, this will actually be carried out by myself and, and the group of legal advisors and department officers at the Department of Justice. Uh, in close cooperation with the Department of Education and Research and the Department of Culture. Uh, this is one way to do it. In some countries, uh, there we go the, the road instead of, of uh, appointing a single rapporteur, and that's often a senior legal academic, a legal professor, that will do a, a report, uh, a review, and uh, propose changes to the national copyright law. But all of the member states will have to observe uh, other uh, copyright binding legal uh, copyright uh, arrangements such as the uh, InfoSoc Directive of 2001 and the Berne Convention. Um, and uh, we will do it in cooperation with uh, different uh, departments, education, cultural research, but also a reference group. And we will start our first meeting, the June uh, 14th, um, so it's quite soon. And we have invited quite, because this, this directive affects so many sectors, it's not just libraries, cultural heritage institutions and so on. It's also publishers, industry, uh, courts, uh, artists, organizations, with the, like, the lawyers bar, uh, the CMOs, like the management organizations, uh, the libraries, of course, but also journalists, musicians, uh, the wider industry, writers, performing artists, and also content providers such as Facebook, Google, and Spotify. And they will also provide uh, their input on how we're going to implement this on, on the Swedish level. Uh, another thing that the European Commission will do actually now is to, to, to work on their guidance, their, their European-wide guidelines on the implementation of the directive. And this is especially important uh, to uh, the so-called upload filters, Article 17, uh, that Armin was talking about. So uh, for this article, there will be uh, union-wide uh, guidelines on how to apply this legal responsibility for the internet service providers. Um, and this will be uh, an interesting work for the new European Commission. Uh, our national time frame is that we're going to work with reference groups uh, throughout the spring uh, of uh, 2019 and the fall of uh, so the fall of this year and spring of 2020, with the uh, uppermost time limit that uh, we will have changes to the Swedish Copyright Act approved by Parliament and with legal effect as of July 1st, uh, 2021. And there will be, of course, parallel processes in uh, the other uh, members. 
of the European Union. So there's still time to influence your, your national legislators uh, on this subject. And if I may give some advice, uh, when, when talking about uh, implementation, uh, you also have to be aware that there's a lot of politics uh, when you, as a governmental department, implement legislation. So the most important thing is like uh, costs and jobs. Uh, so that's that's always a uh, sort of filter that you have to view uh, your your legislative proposals within. Um, in Sweden, it's also the case that we have a coalition government, uh, so uh, we have to take into account different views uh, of the national political constellations. And given the uh, recent European Parliament elections, we also have a new political landscape in uh, the European Parliament where we have a bigger ALDE group, the Liberal group, uh, and uh, a slightly decreased influence for the Social Democrats, uh, SD group, and the Conservative EPP group, uh, but also, of course, increased influence uh, for, for the more uh, shall say radical uh, parties uh, on the left and the right. We will have a new commission this, this autumn uh, which, uh, where the most important position uh, will, of course, be the president of the new commission. Uh, as is expected, uh, for, for a long time, uh, the, the front runner is uh, the front runner speaker candidate is uh, uh, Manfred Weber from, from uh, the German CDU party. Um, but that's, that's a bit more doubtful now that he's, he's set to get the position. And we, of course, and this, uh, if you have any questions on this, uh, Ben will have to answer them, and we have the Brexit question still. Uh, so this is political uh, factors uh, that has to be regarded when, when implementing uh, these, these articles on a national level. Uh, I could also point out that there's a section that we haven't talked about today uh, that regards transparency articles. So that's the last part of the directive. And uh, that's uh, a lot to do with fair remuneration, uh, transparency of revenues, but also dispute resolution mechanisms. So what we are looking into now at the Department of Justice is what kind of court uh, should be responsible for uh, handling uh, disputes uh, regarding remuneration for copyright protected works. And I suppose, talking to my uh, European colleagues, that the new um, extended collective licensing with extended effect mechanism uh, will also be quite a new feature in uh, European countries where you, you don't have the tradition of, of ECLs that we have in Scandinavia, because in Scandinavia we had the ECL provisions for, uh, since the 1960s, actually it started for, for television. So we have quite good relationships between the users and the collective management organizations, but that, that will be an issue uh, of um, quite some implementation work in countries without an ECL provision. Uh, uh, and that's pretty much uh, my advice for, for influencing your national government on, on the implementation and changes in your national copyright acts. Uh, thank you very much. And I think there's time for some questions that we have in chat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All three of you, Ben, uh, Armin, and uh, Jonas, we had uh, quite a few questions in the chat box, and uh, I would like to thank Ben, uh, who took the initiative to answer most of them in the chat box. Uh, so we have saved some time because we try to keep those webinars uh, close to one hour, but we have, let's say, five minutes to ask uh, a couple of questions, first of all. Uh, this, um, um, I lost it. Okay, this one from Chris uh, goes most probably to Armin, and uh, Chris asks whether uh, Article 5 requires uh, a, mem a member state uh, to have more flexible teaching exceptions to narrow the scope, and uh, he's thinking specifically of the requirement on an educational establishment must have arranged the teaching event. If I have not missed the 
answer. Armin, can you answer that? Um, I'm trying to to answer it. So um, it was a, the question was about the flexibility in Article Five for the member states. Mm -hmm. Uh, as far as I understood, I, I can't find it now on, on the chat at the moment. Um, well, um, we have flexibility. Well, I, I can kind of go maybe. Well, no, I'm not trying to get back to the, to the slide now. It takes too long. So we um, have this mandatory part that member states have to uh, make possible this this uh, electronic learning environments uh, in which you can make available uh, copyrighted work for this closed groups of of students um, and the member states can provide for this uh, licensing uh, platform I think I'm repeating myself but maybe I just uh, not uh, didn't really understand uh, the question now um, so if, um, for, for example, publishers uh, build up a licensing platform uh, where the educational establishments like universities have easy uh, and suitable access um, to licenses, especially um, made for this kind of, of uh, online teaching, only maybe just by to get it by click or something, so easily available, licensing platform where the payment goes directly to the uh, to the rights holder is um, is um, well overruns the legal uh, provision of or legal exception of this uh, um, yeah e-learning um, possibility Okay, another question that we had is whether, you know, those upload filters will be applied retrospectively. I mean, I don't know if you or Jonas would like to answer that. Yeah, well, I think uh, what, 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 well, depends what means re re retrospectively. If a platform like YouTube has something online uh, and the communication to the public is going on, um, then the works which are already online on YouTube or on Facebook or on Tumblr or on on whatever, uh, they are concerned from this law, even if you uploaded them uh, five years ago, because this communication to the public takes place now and not in the past. So, um, well, certainly it will not apply to works which have been on YouTube uh, three years ago, and then uh, was taken were taken down. Then, but everything which is now on the web will be included. Okay, great. Do we have any other questions? I mean, um, uh, we have already exceeded our time, and it would be nice to close uh, the webinar somewhere around here. Any one of our presenters that would like to add uh, a few uh, last lines? Hi, um, just I put it in the chat box, but just to say as LIBA, we really want to support people around implementation at the member state level, whether that's in terms of legal interpretation or having the kind of the tools necessary to engage with uh, government in in those round tables and workshops that you will have um we're, we're we're keen to do that along with the other library associations so if you are if you do want to get involved um please um or even if you don't want to get involved we're interested in in as LIBA finding out what's happening in different member states around implementation so i've put the email to email us on in in the chat thank you Super. Uh, one thing, yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, all of you, for attending this uh, webinar. I would like to thank uh, Ben, 
Armin and uh, Jonas, uh, as well as uh, the Liber uh, office for arranging this. And uh, we will hope to see you in Dublin in a couple of uh, days and uh, talk about those developments there, as well as to see you in another uh, future um, webinar. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.